let's look at Ohm's Law and other circuits topics. So before we get into that, we really need a way to represent circuits well. Uh, it's a frustrating thing to have to draw a physical representation of a battery and a wire and a light bulb. Those are objects with lots of details. So we usually represent those things as symbols or with symbols. So for instance, an electrical cell we usually represent like this. And the long side would be the positive terminal and the short side is the negative terminal. A battery, turns out a battery, battery is just a combination of cells. So this is how we represent a battery in a circuit. Long side is the positive terminal, short side is the negative. We also have a common way to represent a resistor like this. Um, that's the way that it's going to be used in this class. In the rest of the world it's drawn this way as zigzags. So be comfortable with seeing that too. And then we have a bunch of other symbols that we can talk about, but we'll encounter those later. The other thing that we'll encounter are devices which measure current and potential difference. So let's look at those. A device which measures current is called an ammeter, not an amp meter, an ammeter. An ammeter measures current that goes through it. And that's important. The current must pass through the ammeter for the ammeter to measure it. So the ammeter has to be placed in a circuit so that current flows through it, and that's the current that the ammeter will measure. A voltmeter, you can guess, is a device to measure the potential difference across its two ends. So I'll draw a voltmeter symbol here, and if we attach it to a resistor, say, the voltmeter will measure the potential difference across its two ends. Okay, so there's an ammeter and a voltmeter, and let's draw it in a circuit. So let's say we have a simple circuit with a cell and a resistor. If the ammeter is in this location, the ammeter will measure the current passing through that point where it's placed. The voltmeter will measure the potential difference across this resistor. Okay. And we can make more complicated circuits with bunches of resistors and a battery. But just keep in mind, the ammeter will only measure the current that goes through it. The voltmeter will only measure the potential difference across its two ends. And an ideal voltmeter, the best voltmeter that we can imagine, would have no current flowing through it. It would be like a brick wall for current. It would have an infinite resistance if it were ideal. An ideal ammeter, however, an ideal ammeter shouldn't affect the current that goes through it. So an ideal ammeter should just let current flow through it and it should have zero resistance. Okay, now let's look at Ohm's law. So imagine we have a single resistor and we have an ammeter placed to measure the current that's going through it and we have a voltmeter placed to measure the potential difference across the resistor. Ohm's law states an object is proportional to the current through the object as long as the resistor's characteristics are constant. And by characteristics, we mean the temperature, the radius, the length, physical characteristics. So if we were to draw a graph of the potential difference versus the current, the potential difference across the resistor versus the current through the resistor, we should get a straight line. Okay, and the slope of that line well, the slope of that line is the change of the potential difference divided by the change in the current. The slope of the line should be the resistance. Sad thing is, Ohm's law is an approximation. Usually it is a very good approximation. Uh, it is better in some situations than other situations, and that's why we use it. But you got to keep in mind that it doesn't always work perfectly. If you have a resistor which closely follows Ohm's law, we'll call it the potential difference versus current graph for an ohmic resistor. So you can see more current means the potential difference increases uh, proportionally. A resistor which does not follow Ohm's law is called non-ohmic. And I'll draw a potential difference versus current graph for two of those kinds of things. In those cases, we do not get a perfect straight line graph because the potential difference is not proportional. An example of a non-ohmic resistor is a light bulb, a regular old incandescent light bulb. They are non-ohmic because when current passes through that filament, the filament gets very, very hot. And that goes back to when we talked about electrons flowing through a material. The electrons impact the atoms, the atoms gain kinetic energy, they move around more, 
and the filament increases in temperature. It gets hotter. And as it heats up, that makes it more difficult for the electrons to flow through it. Low, because it's getting hotter, the resistance of the filament itself increases. So the resistance changes as more current flows through it, and the bulb is non-ohmic. We're going to talk about another quantity called resistivity. Resistivity is a quantity which measures the resistance that's provided by a material. It's given a symbol rho, which looks like a P, but you can notice it doesn't have that funny little thing sticking up like a P does. Uh, the unit is the ohm meter. And the resistivity is equal to the resistance of a resistor times the cross-sectional area of the resistor divided by the length of the resistor. All right. Resistivity is dependent upon uh, the material and the material alone. So, for instance, uh, copper and silver, which are both conductors, they have very, very low resistivities. Remember, resistivity tells you how much resistance is provided by a material. Well, conductors don't resist very much. They don't resist the flow of electrons. So conducting materials will have very low resistivity. Insulators, however, will have very high resistivities because those materials, they do oppose the flow of current. They will provide a lot of resistance. All right. Now let's look at the two different types of connections that are common uh, in circuits. We're going to look at series connections and parallel connections. A series connection is a connection where the resistors are arranged so that current flows through them one after another. The same current flows through each resistor in a series connection. So keep that in mind. Resistors in series all have the same current flowing through them, but they may have different potential differences. Okay. In a parallel connection, this is a connection where the resistors have the same potential difference across them, but they may have different currents, currents flowing through them. So, in series, the same current flows through every resistor. In parallel, it's the same potential difference across each resistor. Now we can find the total resistance that's provided by different combinations of resistors. So, for a series connection, if you have a bunch of resistors, the total resistance of that combination, of that arrangement of resistors, is just the sum of the resistances. Okay, so if we had three 3-ohm three resistors in series, the total resistance of that combination of resistors is just 3 ohms plus 3 ohms plus 3 ohms, or 9 ohms. We call this the equivalent resistance of that combination of resistors. For a parallel combination, it's a little more complicated. I'll write down the equation here. So let's say that we had three 3-ohm three resistors connected in parallel. Well, the equivalent resistance of that combination is going to be, well, let's see, 1 over REQ is equal to 1 over 3 ohms plus 1 over 3 ohms plus 1 over 3 ohms. So 1 over the equivalent resistance is equal to 3 over 3 ohms, which is 1 over 1 ohm. So the equivalent resistance is 1 ohm. And if you notice, it's kind of strange. If you have a parallel combination, the equivalent resistance in a parallel combination is always smaller than the individual resistances, than any of the individual resistances. Whereas if they're in series, the total resistance is always greater than the individual resistances.